All right, we can get started here. This is the uh, one o'clock presentation by uh, George Anastasopoulos on the Sharonian coin, a toll to the afterworld. Uh, this is a study on the tradition of coins used in the ancient world related to the death experience. Uh, George will be looking at relevant customs in different locations and eras of the ancient world and uh, sharing some archeological findings uh, supported with photographic evidence. So George, if you want to start sharing, uh, you can uh, take it from here. Okay. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, hello. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm uh, George Anastasopoulos talking to you from uh, Los Angeles today. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to clarify that uh, I am an engineer in profession, so I'm not an archeologist but uh, collecting coins was my hobby from 10 years old. And uh, now I'm also collecting ancient coins. And I say now because uh, I was born and grown up in Greece. I came to America for uh, my studies at uh, 1980s. So when I was a kid and still now in Europe, it is illegal to collect ancient coins. Only government is allowed to do it. So and uh, universities and museums and so on. So there, it was very difficult to collect ancient coins that time. And I was collecting regular coins. Now, uh, from the moment I came to America, I could extend my hobby to include uh, also ancients. The presentation today is about Caronian coin. It is a coin that was used related to death ceremonies. I will explain a little bit to you the, a little bit about the history, the background, and the beliefs in ancient Greece about the death and what was going on over there. Then I will present you archaeological findings about the Caronian coin, and uh, then we're going to have some uh, discussion about the conclusion of uh, this presentation. So I'm going to start first with uh, a little bit history. We say Charonian coin, but who was Charon? Charon was the boatman of the underworld who rode the souls of the departed across a river to their eternal destination. That river in mythology is called Acheron, and in Latin it is called Styx. So in order for the dead to cross the river and arrive to their final destination, they had to pay a fee. And that fee was the so-called the famous Charonian coin because it was the coin that they had to pay to Charon, who was the boatman. So, and where is Charon was taking them? Actually, Charon was taking them to the realm of Hades, Hades. So Hades was the, let's say the after war, the, the, world, the world after death. And it has two separate areas. One area was the Elysium, and it was also called the Elysian Fields or Elysian Plain. And it was something similar to what we consider now in uh, the modern religions as paradise. So it was the place that the heroes or the people who were uh, good people and moral people uh, were sent. And uh, Elysian Plains was a place for the blessed dead and it was an entrance to the uh, afterlife world and a nice version of the afterlife world. On the other hand, also Hadis included another area, another realm, that it was called Tartarus. Tartarus is something like what we consider in modern religion as the hell. So it was the deep abyss, the lower of the two parts of the underworld. And that was the dungeon of torment and suffering for the wicked. So it was the place where the souls are judged after death and where the wicked received divine punishment. So if you notice the ancient Greek uh, interpretation, let's say, of the afterworld was very similar to what is uh, Christianity today. There was no belief on reincarnation, but it, there was a belief of the paradise and the hell. So very, very similar approach. Now, when we, we, we're discussing about the Hadith, 
the Hadith was not only the location, but it was considered to be a god. So uh, I would like to present you according to cosmogony, which is the history of how the world was created in ancient Greece, of course. Everything started from Athir. Athir was the upper divine sky. That's how uh, everything was generated. And then from the upper divine sky, the Athir, Uranos, the heaven, and Gea, the earth, were generated. So heaven and earth, they merged, they were married, and they had kids, the titans. And among the titans, we had Cronus, who, who was, let's say, the king of the golden age of mankind, and Rhea, who was the mother of gods. I would like to mention at this point that all the mythology in ancient Greece is totally symbolic. Uh, it was not that actually there was a person, physical person, that was Cronus or was Rhea. All this is uh, symbolic, and I will give you an example. Cronus, uh, which was the, the father of the modern uh, uh, gods, uh, actually is uh, in Greece, still in modern Greek, we are using the word Chronos, to, and we mean time. So Cronus is actually the time. And according to mythology, Cronus was eating his kids. Actually, there was no person who was eating kids, but time is eating all the mortals in reality because nobody will survive through time. So all this symbolism was presented with uh, the gods and everything, but everything had an actual meaning. Let's go back to our presentation. So Cronus and Rhea had kids and the, their three major kids was Hades, Zeus, and Poseidon. So Hades, that it is the underworld, actually he was the god of the underworld, and he was the ruler of the underworld. Zeus received the sky, so he was the ruler of the sky, and Poseidon received the sea and the solid earth, and he was the god of the sea and the solid earth. And after them, the, other, the rest of the gods were created. So Hadis, Hadis was the ruler of the underworld. And in Roman also, he's known as Pluto, okay? And he was the boss of Charon, the boatman who was taking the souls to underworld. Hadis actually appears on or a wide range of coins. On the opposite, Charon does not appear in any coins. And usually Hadis appears in coins related to the abduction of his gripe Persephone. You can see on the PowerPoint a, a very nice representation of this myth that it is Hadis who is grabbing Persephone and leading her to underworld. And you see the coins here. Actually, when you see the coins and wherever there is a pink dot, this means this coin is coming from my collection. If there is no dot, it means it's from bibliography, from a museum or whatever a collection. So this representation of abducting Persephone and driving her to underworld, it is very common in ancient uh, coins. Now, Caron coins, actually Caron coin is, is mentioned for first time in literary sources uh, from the second half of the fifth century BC. Actually, the first reference we get is on a theatrical play by Aristophanes called Frogs. And it was played first time on 405 BC. Actually, it is a dialogue between the god Dionysus and the hero Hercules. And Dionysus say, I will follow you in the way you went. And because Hercules already visited the underworld, so Dionysus wanted to know how he could also say, go there. And Hercules said, okay, that's a long way. And it is a long trip to go over there. And first, before you go to the underworld, you have to go through a huge lake, an abyss. We're talking about exactly the area that Charon was there. And then Dionysus said, okay, uh, do I have to get to the other side of that lake? Hercules says, yes, you have to do it on a tiny boat by a very old sailor. And he will take you a two-obble fare same as the fair to the theater. So we're learning here that during that time, the price to go to the theater in ancient Athens was two obols. And then Dionysus says, well, well, 
Will you look at that? The power of two obols, okay? Two obols is everywhere. Hercules say, Theseus, Theseus, the unseen hero, took them down with them, with him, sorry. And when he went down to bring Persephone up, after you cross the lake, you will see millions of snakes and beasts and things that are so horrible to contemplate. And then you say, oh, don't be uh, frightened me. I can easily do it. So this, this, this small dialogue has, makes the first reference to the boatman, Charon, who had to be paid uh, to Obol Fair to pass the souls, the souls to underworld. Also, the Charonian coin, exactly this uh, myth, myth was uh, inspired and is inspiring many modern theater and movie presentation shown the photo of this PowerPoint. I have uh, one recent 2019 play from the uh, from Broadway uh, that is representing exactly this specific point as described on the frogs by Aristophanes. Now the Charonian coin, if we go to the history as a coin and what coins were used as Charonian coin, actually it used to be an obol or two obols, as was described in the frogs. And obol was a, a coin with not, not too much strength. It was like a, a, a coin that everybody could afford to waste, to put in, uh, on the mouth of a death, uh, dead person. So on the Attic weight standard, the obol weighted uh, 0 0.72 grams. Uh, just to give you an, a comparison, an example, we always know, all of us, we know the famous tetradrachm of Athens that was 17 grams. So we can see that that was a very tiny, small coin. Okay, on the other, an older weight standard that was in Egina, the island close to Athens, the obol weighted 1.05 grams, still was a very small coin. So you can see in the pictures many of those obols from different uh, areas of the ancient world that uh, they could use for this purpose. I would also like to comment that the Greek word obol uh, originally meant roasting spit. And it is very interesting because these bundles of iron roasting spit, spits served as primitive forms of money before coinage in ancient Greece. And you can see a picture on the top right of my PowerPoint how they were holding the roasting spits, the first obols, the ancient people, and actually the picture of real roasting spits are they are preserved nowadays to the Numismatic Museum of Athens. So if you visit that, you can see. In addition to the regular uh, obols, the people were using also some, let's say, fake coins of that period uh, for the dead. And those coins were called danachi or lamellas. Thanos in uh, Greece, in Greek language, means death. And uh, if you are, if you're, you or your kids are watching Avengers, you will see that the bad guy is Thanos. And the inspiration of the name is from the Greek word Thanos, which means death. And uh, actually, the uh, the people who developed that movie, they explained how they choose that name. So the Nike was a very small coin, like pseudo coin, made of, of, of gold foil. That's why it had not, it did not have like two faces. It was only one face. And actually what they were doing, they were just getting a small foil from gold and they were just uh, uh, pushing, pressing that over an actual coin. So the copy of that coin was uh, generated. The, the weight was very, very, very little, around to one half to one fourth to a gram. The diameter was six to 12 millimeters. And uh, that was uh, uh, more fancy, let's say, than using a noble without actually spending so much money uh, to create a real gold coin. So you see here two pictures, two photographs of these Danaki coins, the, this, those, uh, 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 let's say pseudo coins, pseudo coins, fake coins that were used for uh, the death, uh, for the dead people as Charonian coins. Those are very rare and difficult to find nowadays. Now the, sorry, the uh, Charonian coin was also used on uh, different uh, 
uh, historical, let's say, texts and, and uh, the theatrical plays. Here we have a famous dialogue uh, of the dead uh, by Lysian of Samozata. And uh, that was, it goes back uh, all the way to second uh, century AD. It, it is a discussion between Haron, the, our boatman, and Menippus. Menippus was a, a philosopher, a very poor philosopher belonging to a group of philosophers that be believe that money are not good for the people, that they are uh, not, uh, they are destroying your character and your personality. So the Menippus is dying, as uh, everybody, and he is meeting Haron uh, on the uh, river to go through that and pass it and go to the underworld. And Haron is asking, says, that's now is the dialogue of the ancient text translated in Greek, in English, sorry, that says, Haron, give me your fare, you rascal. And Menippus says that, uh, by the way, Haron, if it gives you any pleasure, and Haron says, but I brought you a cross, give me my fare. And Menippus said that so, the famous, uh, you can't get blood from a stone, which means that I cannot give you something if I don't have anything. And then Karen says, so, oh, who is so poor that you don't even have one noble? Many who say, uh, I am so poor, and uh, I don't know who else is so poor. So Karen say, pay your Pluto, ha uh, Hades, the king of underworld, will strangle you. And many who say, okay, what worse can happen to me? I'm already dead, actually. And then he says, uh, look, Hermes, Hermes was the god who was uh, uh, guiding the death souls to the underworld. He can pay you. He brought, he brought me here. It was not my choice. So after this discussion that you can read, uh, Haron says, okay, you will, be, you will have the distinction to be the first passenger and the only passenger that ever crossed gratis. So that was a comedy, comedy, as you understand, of the ancient time, but still it is a literature reference to the story of the Haronian coin. So as I told you, also many modern plays are inspired from Haronian coin. And here we can see that the film Troy that was produced uh, by Hollywood in 2004. We can see King uh, Priam of Troy, which was played by Peter O'Toole, and Achilles that was played by Brad Pitt. And uh, Achilles is uh, uh, killing Hector, the son of uh, Priam. And then Priam goes to Achilles and say, give me the body and let me place two coins on his eyes for the boatman. This is exactly the wording of the movie. So here we can see again how this myth is also used on modern movies. Also another modern movie is The Fair that it was produced at 2018, it's a very recent movie, that it is a modern uh, reproduction of the uh, myth of Persephone. And here we can see the coin that the dead person gives a coin to the rider and exactly he says for the ride. So this uh, modern mystery, thr mystery thriller film is something that I suggest you to watch. It's a very nice movie, allegoric, and uh, also has a reference to Haronian coin. So the first time, and I will go now more to the archaeolog archaeological findings and research, the first coins that they are found on the tombs, they are found, they're coming from the Northern Black Sea area. It is a city that it is called Olvia. You see it on the map on the north all the way on the top of the Black Sea. This area now is Ukraine. It's modern Ukraine over there. So in Olbian tombs, uh, we can find that in the period of 7th and 6th century BC, the people were putting small metallic bronze dolphins to the skeletons on the hands of the people who were dead. At that time, on that area, they, didn't use, they were not using yet uh, the common circular coins. So they were using these small metallic dolphins as coins and they were using them as Haronian coins. Of course, of course, we don't know if they had the actual myth, they were using the actual myth of Haron as a boatman, but we know, and it is found from the research of Robinson and Stevens on 1942 and 1991 respectively, that they were using coins to put coins with the dead. And actually they were putting on the, on the hand of the dead 
because in other areas, are you going to see later on, they will use to put the coin on the mouth of the dead. Now we're going to go through the excavations in the area of ancient uh, Greece, which is actually the area also of modern Greece. And I will show you area excavations that they, they found Charonian coins on the actual tombs. So this, uh, the first, I'm going to start from north going south. The first presentation has to do about the excavation was done on 2006 on necropolis of ancient Abdera. Necropolis in Greek language, even in modern Greek means uh, in English, cemetery. Uh, Nekri was the dead polis, was the city. So it was the polis, the city of the dead, the, the cemetery. So in uh, excavation of 2006, uh, we found 10 tombs with Caronian coins uh, out of the 78 excavating tombs. And this covers the whole period from 400 to 100 BC. The first uh, point is that, yes, you see the coin, uh, the coin as it was found and it was on the mouth in this case, on the mouth of the dead person. And uh, the other interesting point I will want you to keep is that it was not in all tombs. Uh, actually, it was found on 10 tombs out of 78. Of course, it does not mean that it could not be on more because many of the tombs are looted. So, and if somebody is looting a tomb, he's going to get the coin, of course. But this is what was found from the excavation. If you go a little bit uh, towards the western area, we go to the Pella. Pella was uh, the capital, let's say, of the uh, Macedonian, uh, old Macedonian kingdom. And on the market that was excavated on 2000, close to the market, uh, we found, uh, the archaeologists actually found Caronian coins uh, in the mouths, again, of the dead people. Here you can see a tomb uh, with a person dead and a Caronian coin. The exact, you see the photos of the Caro exact Caronian coins that they were found on this excavation. It was coins with a horse riding and a, a lion of King Cassander and uh, the Alexander the Great coins with the Jews, the thunderbolt. The thunderbolt you see on the bottom here, the thunderbolt of uh, Jews. So going on on the same area, on an excavation that was uh, completed in 2013 in a cemetery of the period 6th to 2nd century BC, 10 tombs were found with the Charonian coins. Uh, from the Hellenistic period cemetery. So here you can see pictures of the tombs. You see some of the nice findings and you see exact, exact coins of that area. You see in, it says it with Greek letters, Verg, Verg is from Vergi, and Vergi was the village that uh, the excavation was done and they were found. Again, sixth to second century BC. Now we are going on the same area to a much more famous tomb that the Charonian coins were identified. This is the famous Casta, Amphipoli Casta tomb. Of, uh, this uh, this uh, excavation was conducted in 2015. Uh, you know, many, many coins are coming from Amphipoli. Amphipoli was a very big and strong city during the Macedonian era. So on, during uh, the excavation on this tomb, uh, the, it's a period of, uh, and the, that, sorry, for that tomb and that area was used as a cemetery for many years, from 430 to 800 AC, from BC to AC, for more than 1200 years. So obviously many different coins of different historical periods were found. The most important thing though, that on the main, on the main tomb that was uh, excavated in 2015, they found that uh, on the tomb, the coins and monograms of Hephaestion. Hephaestion was the closest friend and general of Alexander the Great. And you see here a picture, a reproduction of the picture of the tomb. It is considered to be one of the most beautiful tombs of the Macedonian era. And if you see on the lower right picture, you see on the bottom of the, the photo I saw you before with uh, Persephone and Hadis. Actually, that photo was coming from this specific tomb. And on the left, you can see how the dead were buried and where they found the coins. You can see on the right pictures similar to the coin that the coins that were found 
on this tomb. So some more pictures from the Amphipoli Casta tomb, exactly the same tomb, other coin that was also found on the tomb. Here you can see many different findings and here you can see the monogram of Hephaestion, which it was found on many areas on the tomb and this is a proof according to archaeologists that that was the tomb of the best friend of Alexander the Great, General Hephaestion. If we go a little bit south in the area of Thessalia, uh, there is an, also a recent excavation that was uh, completed in 2018 at the ancient uh, city of Cranon. Uh, the findings on the tops, uh, on the tops also include uh, many coins, and I pr present you on the lower picture coins from the excavations on the upper one a detailed coin from my own collection which is very similar as you can see to the ones that they could they could found on that tomb and that that coin was very popular on that area uh, in the central greece in the area of britannia another uh, recent excavation of 2018 uh, identified a cemetery, a necropolis that was used from the 2nd to 4th century AC. Many Charonian coins were found on skulls. You see here on the picture with the yellow arrow, the point that such a coin was identified into the tomb. You can see at, even at this moment, moment the, the bones of the dead person are still on the tomb. It is, this uh, photo was taken during the excavation. Uh, going even southern at the area of Ilia, the village of Platania, uh, uh, two uh, tombs with Caronian coins were identified from the period of 350 to 300 BC. So you see it's everywhere, all over the country, the excavations of tombs bring up Caronian points. Even, at the, even southern at the island of Crete, on the area of Aptera, a very recent excavation of 2019, uh, they identified uh, a necropolis of the, that was used in the period of 5th to 4th century BC, and they found uh, uh, again uh, coins with the monogram of Ephestion. And this is very interesting. You see the same, the same monogram that we saw on uh, Amphipolis. And the reason was that uh, the commerce was very strong uh, in ancient Greece, so they were using coins from different areas. So it was not only the local coins that they were used from the local people, but uh, they, they were using also uh, coins from other regions. So you can see here examples of coins, that the Charonian coins, that they were identified in Crete, and this one in the middle comes from Macedonia. In the same uh, island, but on the east uh, part is in St. Nicolaus in Crete, uh, a very famous finding is uh, the finding of the grave eight from the Greek-Roman uh, necropolis, is from the Roman period, uh, dated around 37 and 38 BC. Over there, they found the actual full skull of a young athlete with the gold wreath and the coin. And here you can see that uh, if you visit the museum, you can exactly see the skull and the exact coin that it was identified and found in Crete. Also, this is a coin that is not coming from Crete. So it looks like that in Crete, because it was a very central point of commerce, they had coins from different areas of the world. Actually, this coin, it comes from Panticapium. And it is the old satyr coin, and Panticapium is a city also from the Black Sea, North Black Sea, so it's coming from far away. But the quality of the coin and the skull and the gold wreath is exceptional and uh, supports the tradition of uh, using coins for the death. In uh, the, close to that area, in the necropolis of Acanthus, in, again in Crete, many more coins you can see here, they were found in a series of different uh, tombs of the 4th century BC. You can see here the picture of the ancient cemetery and you can see the picture of the coins. And now I'm going back a little bit uh, northern, going to Peloponnese in ancient Corinth, uh, the Tenea, 
excavation 2018, a very uh, nice coins were found. Actually, it was a cemetery that it was used for approximately 800 years, from 480 to 300 BC to 300 AC. And that's why many Haronian coins are from different historical, historical periods. So you can see the silver stator, the Pegasus, very common coin of Corinthos, that it is coming from the 400 to 300 BC, but also they found the gold second dove coin, this nice beautiful coin here from 350 to 250 BC. Also they found a Roman and a Hellenistic period coins on the same cemetery, because it was a cemetery used for many years. So those, those pictures are actual coins that they identified, Haronian coins that identified on the tombs from that area. And I will conclude this small tour of the cemeteries of ancient Greece from the most famous of all. This is in Athens, and this is a so-called Keramikos cemetery. This is the a cemetery that was used for uh, probably 3,000 years. It's, they're starting using it from 2700 BC, so their findings from that period until 700 AC. Uh, I'm not going to show you though a coin here, but I will show one of the most rare representations of Haron, the boatman. So on the Keramikos Cemetery in Athens, they found this uh, multi-figure marble relief, and they are calling it Haronian relief. It is dated back to 340, and it is very rare because it is one of the unique sculptures depicting the two elderly men that they are flanked by two women around a table with breads probably in sweets. And from the left, you can see the boat that is approaching with the boatman Haron, who will take the diners across the waters of Aheron. So this is a very unique and very rare representation of Haron by himself, the actual Haron. So this concludes my part of the presentation of the coins that they were found in excavations in many different areas of the ancient uh, Greece. And uh, I would like to raise a question that this, does the river uh, Aheron exist actually? This river that Boltman used to take the souls to the underworld, and if so, where it is located? So the answer is yes, yes. So you, the, the river is located on that area of uh, Western Greece where you see this uh, red uh, dot on the Google map. So here you see the whole country, here you see where is the Acheron River and Lake, and even nowadays, the name of the river is called the Heron. So, this is how the map looked like in the ancient uh, time, but also it is looking very similar now. And uh, you can see this is the river Acheron driving to Acherusia Lake, and this con it continues up all the way to the mountain. So that is the region of Acheron River. And this is me last summer visiting the area, the Acheron River. And here is Yanis, who is, is not called the... Uh, uh, Haron, but he is Yanis and he's the modern boatman. So I hired the Yanis to take me through the Heron River. Uh, the modern uh, fee is the modern ticket is not one noble, it is five euro. But thank God it, this uh, ticket is a two way ticket. So Yanis is bringing you back. And that's why I can be here and uh, give you this presentation. So the trip uh, on this area starts from the Ionian Sea, which is the extension of Adriatic Sea between Italy and Greece. Uh, it is, it is uh, the boatman will take you to the seaside caves uh, at uh, by Acheron River, but they are on the sea. And according to the myths still believed by locals, those are the gates that Persephone enters to her winter kingdom to meet her king and husband Hedis. So those are the gates to the underworld. And those are the gates that the Ulysses and uh, Hercules uh, went through to visit the underworld. So you can still visit them today, this uh, beautiful scenery. And then the boat is uh, going for upwards 
on the river of Acheron. So this is how the river Acheron looks, uh, looks like today. Uh, you can see very characteristic elliptical water lilies that they are unique on that river. You cannot finding, find them anywhere in the world. And you can see the special nightingale uh, nests that they are shaped like this to protect the small nightingales from the snakes. And then when you go up, you arrive at what used to be the ancient lake of Acheron where the Necromandion was located. What was the Necromandion? Necro means dead, Mandion means oracle. So it was a unique place. It was the oracle of the dead. So it was the point where the ancient Anhero River was meeting the Lake Acherusia. And that's wh where they built this Necromantion. It was of one of the three famous ancient Greek oracles. Uh, you may know uh, the Delphi, which is the most uh, famous uh, dedicated to Apollo, the Dodoni oracle that was dedicated to Zeus, and this one, which was the Necromantion dedicated to Hades for the underworld. So this is the entrance to the Necromantion, to the oracle of the dead, as it is saved today. And the visitors on Necromantion, it was the people who actually wanted to go and talk to the dead. So if somebody wanted to go, to go and take, talk to the dead, to their ancestors or whatever, they had to go to that uh, oracle and they had to go through a 28 body and soul cleaning process. And only after that process, they were allowed to meet their dead relatives. And here, this is what underground hall looked like and looks like today. It is the exact area where the dead and the alive could meet. And the dead could speak to their relatives, of course, through the mediation of the oracle. This is how the oracle hall looks today. And it is really a fascinating experience. It is over there that the people were going and some were hidden, was the oracle. And uh, actually after a 28, uh, a very strong fast, you are not also very mentally strong. And over there was going the whole discussion between the people and the alive people and the dead people through the oracle. So this is also a place you can visit today. It is the whole story. It is also described on uh, the uh, ancient uh, text of uh, between Odysseus, Ulysses, and uh, who visited the underworld, where he was asked that, uh, oh, Odysseus, that you are Laertes' son and the child of Jews, uh, how, how brave you are. Uh, what exploit you will have ever dream of to, to top this one? How can you dare to go, to come into Hades, the home of dwelling place for the mindless dead sages of worn out men? So this is, this is a text from uh, uh, Iliad, Iliad from uh, Homer, and it describes the visit of Odysseus into Hades. And this is another picture of the uh, dead oracle that uh, uh, Odysseus went through to talk to the dead. So this is my last PowerPoint, and I would like to conclude what we discussed today. And my main question, is it myth or reality? Uh, was that Heronian coin a common tradition, or it is just a myth? In reality, as we dis presented, uh, the earliest Greek graves, graves sorry, bearing coins are are dated from 470 BC. And uh, they were, that period, they were placing the coins on the heads of the dead. It is also the same period that we have references through the theatrical plays in ancient Athens about the Charonian coin. After the 400, 400 BC, it is becoming more customary, but it is more customary to place the, kind, the coin in the mouth. This period also, we have the fake coins, the Danakis and Lamellas, the gold ones, that they are appearing to be used. And all over the classical Greek world, from the statistics from the archaeologists, only 4 to 10% of the burials excavated are including ancient coins in Athens, 
and they go up to 5 to 15 percent in cemeteries, including pre-Christian Romans. As, as I said before, most of the most of the tombs that we are excavating now are looted already, and they are looted many times, from ancient times until now. So although this percentage is from 10 to 15 percent are really small, probably the actual number was a little bit higher, because when somebody is looting the tomb, they are also getting all the coins. So in order to conclude, the Caron's coin was the guideline on what the deceit needed to pass in the world, but it was a symbolic gesture. It was an ideal, but not something that occurred regularly in reality. So the myth was there. The ancient people knew the myth, but it, they were not uh, forced to put the coin. It was something symbolic, and the ones we wanted to do, they were putting uh, uh, the coin on the dead people. So you see here on the picture a Roman skull, with a noble, which is an Antonius Pius, Pius uh, de Pontius. You can see the coin actually here from an actual excavation. So when you will, if you would like to download the presentation, you will find also the uh, many references I used for this presentation. And for the next uh, minutes, I would, I would be happy to reply to any questions as long as I can reply to them. As I told you, I'm not an archaeologist, so I cannot give you all the small, the small details of the excavations, but uh, I would be happy to discuss with you and chat with you. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot, George. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, we have uh, one question. Um, uh, did the English continue this tradition with large coppers? Yes, I, I, although the presentation I do uh, is uh, covering the period, including the Roman period. Actually, in uh, all the Roman world, going all the way up to England, there are Charonian coins found in the tombs. Now, we don't know if the local people had an understanding of the same myth, but putting coins and adding coins to the death it was a tradition not only developed uh, in the ancient Greece area, but it, through the Roman uh, Empire, it was extended to the whole region, so all yeah, the way to England. Uh, even within the American tradition, I know uh, there were two coins that were put over President Lincoln's eyes uh, mm -hmm. when he was assassinated uh, in 1865. I believe those two coins are today in the Chicago Historical Society. Um, yeah, on, and in many areas of the world now, okay? Yeah. Because this, this is becoming a tradition. You know, history has a continuity. And it's not something that happens on historic period. Myths like this, that they have very strong symbolical mean. And they, it is the afterworld, take care of your dead people in the afterworld. They continue and grow on. And if you notice, even the meaning of paradise and the hell that comes from ancient Greece, it was somehow transferred to Christianity. It was not some that automatically the Christians developed the principle of hell and paradise after Jesus, that Jesus becoming a, 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 a religion, created a religion. It is a continuation of the tradition that was transferred from one uh, religion to the other. And this is very common. If, for example, you, vi you, you visit the ancient uh, museum of uh, Vergina, who is the ancient Pella, the capital of Macedonia, you will see the tomb, the box uh, with the bones of Philip, the second who was the dad of Alexander the Great, and you will see it, it is full of angels on it. Real angels with, uh, uh, exactly as we depict them today. It was not that the tradition of angel was generated in Christianity, it was just transferred to them from the previous religions. You know, people are very conservative. They, when they believe something, they don't change it. So the traditions go on. And if, even if religions are changing, the traditions remain, remain under a different packaging, of course. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it just demonstrates that there's some of these questions that are sort of timeless and sort of uh, inherent to the condition of our humanity 
uh, you know, uh, concern about the afterlife. And, you know, as you say, these things are, you know, just uh, traditionally something that humans have thought about. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, are there any other Greek myths related to coins? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I cannot say similar to that, but the coins in Greece used the, I could say, a very important part of the everyday life. Okay. So I, I'm not prepared to present some other myths. But uh, I, I'm sure that the searching on the literature, the, there will be reference to them. And I, it is very interesting question to, to search more and uh, find, find out more about this. And I would guess that a lot of the Greek coins themselves uh, depict uh, certain mythological figures. Oh, yes, that's for sure. Because on that cane, the myth refers to a coin. But coins referring to the myths, there are many with uh, Hercules, which was a mythical person, Theseus, and so on. So many of the ancient myths of uh, Greek mythology are depicting on the coins. And it is very interesting that uh, in ancient Greece, the coins did not depict the faces of the leaders. That started later on Hellenistic period and uh, the Roman period. In the ancient Greek period, the, the pictures were related to the city. And most of the cities, because the cities were states, independent states, they were putting their logos, and those logos were interrelated with the city and the myth behind it. For example, the most common tetradrachm, the one from uh, Athens with the Athena and the owl, actually the myth is depicting the myth of Athena, who was the goddess that gave the name on the city of Athens, the city-state of Athens, and she was the goddess who won the fight with uh, Poseidon, Nupion. And uh, when there was the myth that uh, somebody has to give a name to that new city, and uh, Athena and Poseidon had to compete, and uh, the myth says that uh, the locals say, whoever is going to give us the most valuable present will win the fight. So it will not be an actual physical fight, but it will be a fight of presence. And whoever gives the most valuable present will get also, will become the, uh, will use the, his, his name for the city. So the option would be Athens would be called either Athens from Athena and, or Poseidonia from Poseidon. And Poseidon gave them water and uh, Athena gave them the olive tree. So Athenians found that olive tree is much more useful for them and they choose Athena. So this myth is depicted on the coin, the most common coin of ancient Greek world, the Tetradrachm of Athens. All right, and then uh, uh, one question for you, George. Uh, do you collect ancient Greek coins? And if so, uh, what particular types? Okay, <laughs> I collect, as I told you when I was a young kid, even from 10 years old, I was collecting in Greek coins, but I could collect only modern Greek because it was not allowed to collect ancient. When I came to America, things changed. <laughs> so I started collecting uh, ancient Greek. Of course, ancient Greek history has many phases. Uh, I prefer to collect from the classical period. Still, I have in my collection some Hellenistic or Macedonian and some Roman but, and some Byzantine, but uh, the most important period I emphasize is the classical ancient Greece. And we're talking about what is Greece now and what is East Turkey. East Turkey now and what it is South Italy now. So all that, uh, all that uh, region. So my collection mainly emphasizes on that. But still you may find some Hellenistic. Hellenistic, you know, is the period during the Alexander the Great and Macedonian period. Uh, his uh, generals who built up the Hellenistic king, king, uh, kingdoms all over the East uh, Mediterranean. And uh, then it was uh, the Roman period and then the Byzantine period. All right. Any other questions out there? Uh, you can enter them in the chat or the uh, question and answer. All right, um, I think that's it. Uh, well, thank you very much, George, for uh, presenting. It's a very interesting topic. Um, and I kind of like, uh, you know, this idea that uh, 
you know, these questions really are, are, are timeless and traditional and uh, uh, impact uh, really uh, cultures over many millennia. So yeah, yeah, that's true. I so, also thank you very much for the invitation. And I thank all of those uh, ladies and gentlemen that uh, they dedicated their time to attend my presentation. Thank, thank you very much to all of you. Thanks, George.